Hi, this is DC Douglas. You may know me as Chase from Transformers Rescue Bots or Legion on Mass Effect or Albert Wesker on Resident Evil, and you are watching Criticologus, also known as Criticologus. <laughs> Like, what was the first reaction when you got, when you did Wesker on a voice acting mic? My first reaction, I think it should be said that the, the character's been around since 1996, with the very first Resident Evil game, and it, then it was voiced by Sergio Jones, who I don't know where he is the, these days, I actually tried to get in touch with him, uh, then was taken over by Richard Waugh, who is a Canadian actor, um, and uh, uh, everything Canadian, I'm just going to keep pointing at you. Um, and uh, so he did it for a couple games, and Peter Jessup took it over for a game or so, and then I took it over, so I was the fourth one to come into doing this voice. Um, but I've done the most games. Um, I have seven titles, actually, to, today. The, um, but the, the thing was, when I originally got it for Biohazard, uh, they wanted me to impersonate Peter Jessup's version of Albert Wesker, which is more round, rounded voice, almost, um, I, I don't even know how to do it. Um, and then, because uh, that was that game, and I think I did a horrible job in that game. Then when I, then the next one was the big one, Resident Evil 5, and so I like kept listening to my Peter Jessup version, and then I go in there, and they go, and they play Richard Waugh, and they go, so this is the voice uh, match, and I'm like, well, I can't do Richard Waugh. So, and then thank God they let me kind of blend the two, and then he becomes my own voice after that. And then since then, getting all the fans, I've ch the voice has changed as well because I've done all these special fan-centric videos. So now I go into my Wesker voice, but I don't even know if it sounds like the guy in the game now, because now when I do Albert Wesker, I just talk like this. Uh, but I don't think he sounds like that in the games. So, but as far as the evil stuff, everybody, everybody's evil. Listen, you, you say evil and bad, but in the mind, if it's something that I enjoy, then I just have to think of joyful things. So it makes sense that I would do an evil man really well. <laughs> DC? You! <laughs> I had a question. You do a voice in Blaze Blue, can, but can you play the game? Like, oh. legitimately? Oh! oh. 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 Thing I've got. And so when I'm done, I'm like, done. Oh. And 
and it was, uh, yeah, it was the writing. It was so cool. And plus the fact that I got to be, they gave me male stereotypes for my references in the audition. I was like, well, that's fun. And I always like to take the boys' job. How much, like how many hours do you have recording all these different answers? Wow. I don't know how many hours, but I know that in Mass Effect 3 alone, I had 7,000 lines. Wow. wow. So, yes, in the third one. And the, the thing I don't know if people know about video game acting is it's, a, it's, it's different, obviously, from on-camera stuff, but um, it's also different from cartoons in that 98% of the time, we don't see the script ahead of time. It's cold reading. We walk in and just make it happen, make it work. You know, it's acting on steroids. It's as if you were doing green screen, you know, it, like what they call green screen acting. You've seen that behind the scenes of Game of Thrones thing where everything's yeah. green. Yeah. You know, you kind of have to make it up. It's that, plus there's no other actors in the room, oh. you know. And, and you also, the other thing too is like when I go and I ask about the arc of the story, like, okay, what's our like, what beginning to end, sort of the general sketch of it? Okay, great. And then at any given time, because they've got so many technical things to worry about, we bounce around. I'll record this line here, then I'll go over and record the end, then I come back and do this, and then the next thing is this, and then the next thing is that, and like, oh no, you didn't know that person yet. Okay, now you're really mad at them. Oh no, that never happened. You know? Yeah, the and same, just, <laughs> okay, okay, you, okay. Like, and that's, you yeah, you have to kind of like, you know, erase your short-term memory constantly. Yeah. Sometimes I'm even like, did I do that game? Do you ever, I mean, expect it to do a character just like the Blue Fairy from Once Upon a Time? Did you actually audition to that, or it just like they just gave you the part? Uh, Woo. Hi. Hi, how are you guys? Um, no, the the Blue Fairy I auditioned I, I think three times. I can't really remember because I had just had a baby, so I was like, uh, <laughs> I, I talked to someone. It, do, I, do I need to speak slowly, like because I don't know how many people are good with English? Everybody's cool. I speak, uh, I speak really quickly. I know. So sometimes I have to be like, okay, like take ten percent off of that. Um, uh, somebody said to me a while ago, they were like, oh yeah, I saw you at those auditions, you had your baby with you. And I was like, I, I did? Like I didn't even remember that I had the baby with me. That tells you where I was at when I auditioned for Once Upon a Time. Um, yeah, so that was one where you had to go a bunch of times. Like sometimes you get an offer and you just hang, you just get to come along and sometimes you have to audition, you know, three times, five times, it just depends. Um, and that one I just had no idea where it was going to go, it was just the pilot. And she just had one scene in the pilot. And like I said, I had just had a baby, so I, I didn't really care yet. I, like a lot of times I'll be like, no, no, I, you know, I want to wait for something better or whatever it might be. Um, and that one I just was like, okay, cool. And then I went to watch them shoot the pilot and I brought my little, I had a little girl, she was three at the time, and I brought her to the wedding scene. I don't know how many of you guys know once upon a time. And when I saw the wedding scene, I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, okay, I, this is going to be something big. And then once we saw the pilot, you were like, okay. Like every time you would sort of see another part, you'd say, this is bigger than I thought it was going to be. And to still be here, you know, going into sixth season and to be traveling around the world doing this as the Blue Fairy was something I really did not expect and I'm so grateful for. I'm a YouTuber, but I am also a singer-songwriter. And I, and I saw that you actually, uh, apart from acting, you actually have done Broadway. And that was like really interesting to me because, I mean, as, as a person that does many things in, in the artist uh, career, it's how do you do that? How do you go from Broadway to movies to even writing a book? Uh, Quería decir que yo soy encantada de estar en Puerto Rico. <laughs> Grande del mundo. Um, my career started in theater. Uh, I was from Chicago. I worked in uh, David Mamet's theater company, who you may or may not know, but um, the guy, uh, W.H. Macy, who's the star of Shameless, was in that theater company. We were all, you know, 11 years old. Not really, but. Um, uh, and then I went to New York to continue my studies, and I did do three Broadway shows, and I absolutely adore Broadway, and I adore. Uh, being on stage. Uh, one of those brought me to Los Angeles for a six week tour. I had no intention of staying in Los Angeles. And I liked New York. I thought it was fun. Broadway is the top of the heap. It was a gas. But one thing led to another and I started doing more work in Los Angeles, another play, another play, another play, and then finally um, a TV pilot, a comedy, and then other things. And then I fell in love with somebody in Los Angeles and so I decided to stay in Los Angeles and he moved to Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> 
but by that time, no way were you going to do regional. No, not after Broadway. And then, um, and so by that time, I had given up my my digs in New York, and and I really started to embrace uh, Los Angeles. And while I was there, I started my own theater company, uh, which lasted 15 years. I had a, a theater on Las Palmas in the heart of Hollywood. And uh, when I had my company, uh, it was like a ghetto. And then suddenly they decided to put $10 million into Hollywood and rebuild everything around it. And my little theater, the rent went up four times. <laughs> so after 15 years, I, I, I was unable to continue. But I did, in the meantime, um, have time to write a novel. Um, as uh, somewhat of a historical novel, the theme is revenge and forgiveness, which seems to be, if you read the paper, a pretty popular theme in almost any country in the world, and I have a few copies with me. Um, but Star Trek came along. Shall I continue, or am I doing oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Star Trek, I was doing theater, uh, um, television and film, and uh, what, during my time in LA, and once the guy left for Oregon, there wasn't anything to do but work. So, um, <laughs> I uh, auditioned for Star Trek uh, Next Generation a few times, and I didn't get the part the first few times. They, the feedback they gave to my agent was, well, you're too strong of a character for whatever the role was. So I thought, well, okay. And so finally, they called me in specifically for this Admiral Necheyev, and uh, who was a very strong character. In fact, if you've seen it, the superior officer to Captain Picard who gave him a very hard time because he didn't follow the rules and uh, <laughs> my character did. So um, I got it. And uh, somewhat uh, like what Keegan was sharing, I didn't know it would lead to more than one episode. And then it became several and then I went to DS9 as the same character. And then this thing called conventions started, which yeah. I had no idea that this would be the gift that kept on giving. And I get to go to, um, maybe not all over the world, I've been to England on a convention, but certainly all over the United States, and talking about the Admiral and, um, and uh, how tough she was on Picard. I don't want to take up uh, everybody's time, but I have loved being in, in Star Trek. Um, I think Roddenberry's a genius, was a genius, is still, even though he's not on the Earth anymore. He. Um, uh, really created um, a story um, of hope and vision of a, a better future that I only pray we get to realize while uh, we're still alive. Um, and it was it was a privilege to be part of it. And um, we'd love to hear from all of you. Thank you. Your favorite Wesker moments that, that you know when you were in the booth recording, that one of those moments you really remember that line and you just love it. Oh, because um, my favorite moment was the paycheck, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> David line. Um, you, one of my favorite. You know, there in, in uh, Resident Evil Five, the um, uh, Liam O'Brien directed me in that, and I had uh, known him prior, and, and so I, he's, a, he's got a very dry sense of humor. So after doing, you know, four hours of all these, and the, the thing about this game is, like she was saying, like Mass Effect, we got the script, and it was in a cinematic format. Like you knew what the other lines were that the people were saying. You got an idea of what the story is. But video games up and uh, prior to that, um, and definitely in the 90s, they would give you an Excel spreadsheet with just your lines, and you had no idea of the context. They didn't even give you a breakdown of what was going on, and sometimes the director or producer of the session had no idea either. So you, that's why the acting in some of the early games is really bad. Um, I, Resident Evil 5, even though at this time the industry had changed and people were doing that, they didn't do that for my character. So uh, we sort of had an idea, um, what was going on in the scene, but I didn't know what the other lines were, what the other people were saying. So it, a lot of things seemed very random that I would say. But at one point near the end of this four hour session, um, we were doing what they call, um, uh, I guess, uh, in game lines, uh, when you know, like, um, found you, you know, things like that. And uh, then he, <laughs> we finished it, and he's like, Can you also give me the line, will you, you will give me an egg? And I went, <laughs> He's like, No, I need the line. I'm like, <laughs> Okay, Liam, you will give me an egg. <laughs> and then he's, then he's off mic, he's talking to the Japanese producer. Oh, no, no, no. They're like a little translation thing, because he's like, I require an egg. And I'm like, oh, come on. He's like, I require an egg. And so, and then apparently, and it's like he said it really, they needed it for the game. I didn't believe him until somebody sent me a video once it was out, and like, you're playing the game. He's like, and I now know that an egg is a special thing that you get. That I still, what does it do, though? It it heals you, yes. So, yeah, damn straight, give me an egg. So. <laughs> anyway, so that would be the line, yeah. <laughs>
I think it was asking uh, what was the biggest challenge between the Stormtrooper armor, the Darth Vader, the Darth Vader helmet, and the C3PO full body armor. What's the biggest challenge? Yeah. Um, I would say that probably Vader was the most challenging because they wanted a, a certain amount of evil within the character. Um, and there was so little to go from as well because the original concept work, um, art from um, Ralph McQuarrie wouldn't work for the um, the mask and the helmet. So I had just a small drawing from John Mullo, the costume designer, just a line drawing from one angle. So I had a lot of um, input in the way that Vader looked, i.e. the mask and the helmet. The Stormtrooper armor is fairly straightforward. It's straight from Ralph McQuarrie's uh, concept art, which actually got the uh, Star Wars made in the first place. It was Ralph McQuarrie and George Lucas that went to 20th Century Fox to get the money put up, and it was his original concept art that actually uh, got 20th Century Fox to put the money up. Uh, I'm an aspiring voice actor. I've worked with a band student before, but mm -hmm. I am completely ignorant as to how agencies work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> where should I go to for the first time? So I wanted to know how your experience was, or who did you go to? It's so funny. What did you do to become a voice actor? <laughs> I love I love that Laura redirected you because she did the same exact thing that I did. But she's she's so smart and so lovely and so talented. I, I love Laura. Um, well, there's a great website to go to. It's called I want to be a voice actor.com. I'm serious. I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. It was started by a guy named D. Bradley Baker, who if anybody knows him, yes, he's a yeah. genius. Amazing. Genius. And one of the kindest, most generous human beings on the planet. You'll see when you see how much he's created on this website for free for anyone who wants it. Go there. Uh, there's sort of three pieces you need. You need um, acting lesson you need to learn how to act so go to class go to a good class where you're challenged not one where there's drama um, you need uh, to take classical singing training or Broadway singing training because even if you're not ever going to be a singer you need the ability to take care of your voice physically um, and then the third thing is get your business chops together work it like a business you are only a piece we're up here because we're the ink and the pen we're what you see there are massive teams of people behind us creating incredible product it's never about you. You're the solution. I mean, the solution. You're you're there to solve problems for them. Not you're not the center of attention. You're simply a piece of the puzzle. Be a sorry. I'm so sorry. Give us a moment. Um, and and when you go in the room, oh, there's so much to say. But um, in terms of getting work in a small town, I started in the small market. I started in Birmingham, Alabama, and I spent eight years. Um, there were no agents, so I found a video, an audio studio that would with two guys who would teach me how to do stuff and I did everything they said and I did it over and over and over and it was horrible and I listened and I listened and then I took my ad my demo tape and I cold called ad agencies. I was still in my teens and I put on a little suit and put my hair up in a bun. Wow. And I cold called ad agencies on a schedule to because you have to keep showing up in their consciousness in a nice way when you get off the phone. And if they haven't listened to your stuff, you don't go, really? You go, no worries, great, I'll check back in a couple weeks. And you truly, in your heart of hearts, let them off the hook. They have big lives, they're very busy. And you just keep showing up as this little happy thing in their ear, and eventually you start to get work. And so you gotta work it like that. There's jobs here, there's things to do here. See where you can add value here. And you add value not just when you get a job. You add value when you walk in that room, any room. You add value in this room. You add value the minute you open your eyeballs in the morning. Be a contribution. We are all entitled to, are there any kids in here? We're not entitled to shit. <laughs> you're entitled to breathe, and you're entitled to breathe. That's it. Everything else is a gift. And just practice a lot of gratitude and work, have a work ethic. It's a long game. It's a very long game. And have fun. Great. And, and there are great websites out there. Like she just, there are great websites out there like Voice123 and things like that. But don't go to the show until you're ready. Don't put your demo out until you're ready, until you feel like it competes with those of us who you hear all the time because everyone's on Voice123 and all that. And have a great time. <laughs> Blue has the potential to be a very, very dark villain in the show. Yeah. What are your What are your thoughts about that? And are you up for season six? Uh, am I up for season six? <laughs> <laughs> I'm up for all the seasons. Um, you know, it's so funny this whole like shady blue thing that has happened. 
I know, at least my understanding from the creator side of it, that there was never any intention for that. But I will say that as an actor, to play a nun, for me was not, I was like, what can I do with her? You know what I mean? So I always tried to see if I could put something under that would make people question whether she were, was good or not. And I never really felt like there was a place for it, you know, because they didn't write her lines like that. And I thought, oh, well, it's not gonna work. Like, you can't do it, it's not gonna happen. And then there started to be this kind of weird groundswell of people that really mistrust the Blue Fairy, mostly because she, I don't know why, really. Like, it's just been this really interesting thing, and I know that there are a lot of people who think she is the big bad of the show, and that she's somehow behind everything, which I am really greatly amused by. I don't know that it'll ever happen, not least of which is because I know that the writers, you know, if the fans say, we think so-and-so should be with so-and-so, probably that will never happen. Yeah. So I think the more people say, we think Blue is evil, the less chance I have that I'll get to be evil. <laughs> um, but I think it's like a really interesting notion, and I have heard a lot of people say that she was acting strange when she came back from the hat, and I have to tell you, I didn't do anything in particular to make that be true. Um, but I think because they know so little about her, because she's the only character who actually has never gotten her backstory episode. I'm not really sure why. I hope I didn't say something bad somewhere. Like, I feel like I was at a con somewhere and I said something and now I'm never gonna get a backstory. Don't put that on the internet, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, you know, it's such a broadcast. So th there's, I think because they have never addressed her agenda, that's where that has come from. And I think that that's a really interesting thing that's happened for that character. My guess is that, if anything, that will get wrapped up maybe more toward the end of the show. You know, because when you have a show that sometimes has 80 people on the cast list when we're working, you know, between the dwarves and the fairies and the nuns and the, like, everybody. It's, it's crazy sometimes to be on set and see they have, like, an extra call sheet because there are so many people. Um, I, I think it's, with all of these storylines, it's hard to get to everybody, but I feel like that, that will come maybe towards the end. And since season six is all about untold, untold stories, do you think she'll get hers? I, I, I you know, I never want to, I hope so, sure. I really, like, I'm dying to know things like why is she still a nun when everybody else has kind of gone back to their old personalities and for whatever reason the, the fairies stayed nuns. You know, there's sort of some questions like that that I think would be great to answer. And uh, you know, where they came from, why they are, what they are. And I, I, I do, I think it will come because I think people care to know. And plus we're watching all the babies so they gotta get to us, right? <laughs> Yeah. It's just the weirdest, I know. And every time I'm around, there's like vortexes that suck people out. And it's like, you should never give the babies to the nuns. Because there's a vortex and I lose people. You know. so, sorry about that. Father is Portuguese, I think, right? Yeah. Italian, I can never. I should. I know all the blue fairy and all the languages. It just depends on you know if I'm on Twitter. The, <laughs> the similarities between myself and the blue fairy or Mother Superior, which one? With the blue fairy. With the blue fairy. I mean, I think any time you play any character, you bring a spark of your own to to them. Um, it's funny because I feel like, you know, the Mother Superior character has been more challenging for me to play because she's so straight, which is, I think, why people got this notion that she's evil. But for, you know, if you don't know once upon a time, she's the, like, Mother Superior, she's the nun, then she's the one that people think is evil, um, which I really love. Uh, similarities with the Blue Fairy, I don't know. We both, like, get real dressed up. <laughs> I don't know, I just, I think everybody that you play has a spark that comes from your truth. So with any character, I think that that exists. I can't really think like in particular of something that I could say, oh, there's this, you know what I mean? I think you just always have to find the truth of, of who you play and, and what they're after and what they want and what's in the way of that. Um, but underneath that always is, only can be yourself. Even if you're playing you know, a real life person, I, I think at the end of the day, there's still going to be a part of you that, that's there. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Very quickly, we spoke this morning about how was it working with Patrick Stewart and the crew of, uh, of the cast of uh, Next, Next Generation. I know you, your character still following Captain Picard all over the ship. I remember that. 
how was it working with them? What kind of people that this uh, cast, especially Patrick Stewart, we, that we see him in other movies, and, and, and we'd like to know firsthand from the person that worked actually with him. Thank you for the question and thank you for the welcome. I'm thrilled to be in Puerto Rico and I promise you this will, this is my first time but it won't be my last. Amen. Patrick Stewart is a, is, is a master actor of the first rent and he's a gentleman and uh, very committed to his craft and his work as Picard was fantastic. Um, as I mentioned in the earlier, earlier this afternoon, one of the fun things of one of the episodes I did with him was that he was actually directing it as well as playing opposite me. And so we would have these adversarial conversations and then he'd say, we'd rehearse it and he'd say, okay, wait one minute, I've got to check the camera here. And he'd run around and check the camera and then come back in. And we had the kind of relationship where when the cameraman called, you know, was rolling, we were very adversarial. Uh, with each other, and then they would call cut, and we were like, oh yeah, hi, so where are you going for dinner? I mean, how's that, have you seen this theater? And, you know, and, and it was all friends, so he's, um, he's a lovely man. Jonathan Frakes, who played Riker, who my character was very, very hard on, to say the least, like, you know, throwing him out of the room any chance I got. It was a funny, funny story with that was, um, he, he, he's also a terrific fellow. They all were, actually. But when I um, went on to Deep Space Nine as the Admiral and was commanding Cisco then for a while, uh, Franks directed one of the episodes. So I got to the set, we were called for rehearsal, and he took one look at me and he said, now I get to get my revenge. <laughs> <laughs> he treated me in the next gen. And that was a lot of fun because he directed the episodes that I did. And he was, whoppa, that's good luck. <laughs> My first episode, I had a long, long speech in the beginning uh, explaining why I thought <coughs> Picard should be relieved of his uh, captainship. And uh, it was it was a substantial amount of technical stuff to memorize, but I did my homework and I memorized it. And so I remember clearly the cast was all sitting there, all but Picard, and I'm explaining, you know, the situation and the Federation and what's required, and therefore Picard is fired for now. And it was one long take. And when the director called cut, the rest of the actors went, oh my god, she memorized it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that what happens is when you're a guest star, you end up working really hard because you want to be asked back. Amen. And the regulars are like, you know, like their notes underneath the table. And that. So uh, we had an immediate uh, a mutual admiration and, 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 and affection and respect. So my experience with those cast members was absolutely splendid. And I just want to say that I loved meeting all of you at the Star Trek fleet uh, table. And I'm so thrilled that you exist and have this fellowship. So um, next time I come back, I expect you'll be increasing in numbers. Yep. And what are your favorite sci-fi? I am so much of a nerd. I'm not even a nerd about what's popular. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, funny thing about Bastila Lashan is I'm also Satil Shan, so I am my own grandma. Yeah! <laughs> that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. She's cute. Did they ever make a movie, Mass Effect movie? Yes. Would you be? Oh, in a hot second. <laughs> I would do the, any Mass Effect movie anytime. I would be, you know, woman number four in the corner. I believe they're already in production. They've already worked on that. It's already going. Um, and, you know, given, I don't think we're quite there yet to where you would have any sort of female lead, and if so, it would be a big star, not me. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I would have a Me too. <laughs> me too, thank you. Well, it is just a voice for Legion, isn't it? Yeah. And they are making the movie. So producers, wherever you are, I'm trying to get every camera here. I'm, I'm available. But I know you're going to go with Tom Hiddleston. It's too expensive. This is for DC. I'm Victor. And I'm about to bring you a podcast. And I'm 
Hey, you see, on the eve of E3, you shared the Resident Evil 7 teaser, but you put Psy. <laughs> <laughs> what did I mean by that? Yeah. I meant this. <sighs> <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know if you know that uh, Resident, uh, Resident Evil Umbrella Corps came out. Most people don't know Either they don't know about it or they're sad that they know about it. <laughs> I've never seen a game get such... Wait, this is going on. There's so many cameras. I'm done. Watch what I say. Listen, they put a lot of work into that game. And uh, uh, I actually do the voice of the player in that one. Um, and, but then Albert Wesker, for those of you, spoiler alert. Um, he actually makes an appearance in that game. It is unclear if he actually is back from the dead. Yeah, I died. I'll, just, I'll, I'll help you eventually go. <laughs> he, he, he died. But supposedly, either, he, either he's back from the dead because they say the game is, uh, I can't remember this word, canonical. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that it takes place after RE6, so I've been dead a while apparently. So all of a sudden I'm back and giving instructions. What does that mean? I did record, I don't know how far you got it, but I do record a little, like a short monologue near the end that essentially says, I'm back, bitches. Um, <laughs> but I thought that was just like for a promo thing. So I, thought, I still think he's an Easter egg in that game. I think he's dead. Resident Evil 7's been announced. They've already got graphics going and all of that. I know voice acting comes in a little bit later, but they're talking about an early 2017 release, so I would imagine that they would already be recording now. I've not gotten a call. I do know that Capcom likes me as the voice, so I'm pretty sure, uh, as of now, I am definitely not in it. Uh, later on, if you ask me and I say I cannot confirm nor deny, that will give you a hint. <laughs> but the side was because I would love to come back in, in, a, in, a, in a big game as well, even as a flashback or something, just because the fans love him so much and I would love to keep doing the voice. So. I love like sciencey stuff. I love, I'm a Top Gear nut, but only the real Top Gear, the British one, sorry. Yeah. Um, and I love sciencey shows. I, I like sci fi. I think it's really, it, it's where. I, some of the coolest and brightest things come from. And if you look at our modern tech, it's largely inspired by old sci-fi. Right. You know, in a way, we drive culture in the world. And now it's becoming more obvious because sci-fi is cool, which is kind of disappointing in a way. But it's exciting, too. Um, but I'm a nerd about things like you know, economics and money and art and human behavior. <laughs> so I'm a real nerd, um, I guess, whatever, in that way. When I grew up, I was the kid everyone made fun of. I'm not kidding you. I had no friends. I hung out with my dog, and I read. You know, that's, but it was awesome, but wasn't awesome at the time. It really sucked. But in hindsight, it's awesome because it got me here, and this is awesome. So, yeah. I have the most well read dog. Exactly. Oh, God. Oh, well played. But when you said about, like, they're sort of on the forefront, it's so interesting, some of these shows, even as simple as I was thinking about doing it, I did a sci-fi show years and years ago, and they gave us these tablets, and all they were was, like, little chunks of plexiglass, and they were like, this is yours, you know, and do this. And I was like, okay. And then, you know, I got an iPad a couple of years later, I was like, oh, look at that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it really is true, like, everything you, can, yeah, everything you can imagine, Picasso said that, everything you can imagine is real, and I think sci-fi is on the forefront of that, you know, and I think, what comes in the future, we're going to look back and go, wow, they're right. There's often the ones that you audition for and then you have to watch it and you're like, oh, they were good. I hate that they were good. But, um, you know, like Scott Cersei. Uh, <laughs> uh, who wouldn't want to play her? What woman would not want to play that role? Or man. <laughs> Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. She'll underplay everything. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. All I want to do is the scene where I'm naked walking through town. That's the only <laughs> Shane, the shame of Rosa Levy, because I deserve it. <laughs> I, and I, I think it's probably true in all, all aspects of acting. We're surrounded with the most brilliant, incredible, lovely human beings that I'll read. I've read through stuff and I've been like, oh man, that was a phenomenal. I was in there for 25 minutes. That was an incredible audition. That, and who got And I was like, oh my God, I find out who's got it. And I'm like, she's amazing. Yes, because there's plenty to go around. And I think that's part of our job is to recreate the 21st century and, and take us all forward into the world where there's enough to go around. You know, and because there truly is. 
And I always, I look at it like, I always call it kiwis and tangelos. Like they're both sort of what kind of fruits? Like what is that? Yeah. And, but it's like, what's right for the salad? You're an amazing kiwi. It's just, there's no kiwi in the salad. We That's wanted the tangelo for this salad. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, that's just how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, essentially everything that, 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 that they all said. I mean, you, you can always, I can always say, you know, so you, you went out on a date, right? Um, and uh, you had some chemistry with the person you were on the date with. And, uh, and then your friend said, oh, I could have done that so much better. It doesn't quite make sense, does it? Yeah. <laughs> your yeah. friend would be a whole other chemistry with that person. Yes. And other things would have been talked about and all of that. Yes. So it's, that's, you know, I mean, there's, there's a certain technical... Uh, uh, level uh, what's the, uh, proficiency that, that, that you need, that one should have and not all it always does. There is those kinds of moments you can see in films and TV and theater and whatnot, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's rare usually. Um, it, it, most people can have that proficiency. So once you have that proficiency, like she said, everything after that is like, what do you want in your salad kind of thing. And also it's about who's making the salad. So this person's like, you know, you look at the salad and you say, we're going to make a Caesar and you say, well, I'll be your chicken. <laughs> Let's go with this metaphor as long as we can. And I'll be your chicken. And he's like, we wanted an egg. And he's like, yeah. He's like, no. I mean, I mean Caesar, like you know, with the the tuna and your chicken, and I want tuna. And I'm like, you're right. My look would be like, I'm freaking chicken. You want a Caesar salad? What's the problem? And you say tuna, and then you watch and you go. Okay, well that's, uh, what do they call that salad with the tuna in it? What's it so what a great Niswa salad they made, but that guy thinks all along he's made a great Caesar salad. But you know, but that's it, it's like, a better way to put that, letting my metaphor go, their metaphor go, is that, is that it's, it's, you know, I, I can, five people can go in and read for a role and they all can be very different, but uh, what, the person who gets to choose, uh, they gravitated towards person number two because it reminded him of his uncle or his, uh, an ex-girlfriend or something. There's some quality that struck him in, in the, uh, for, from his own experiences or her own experiences. And that's why the, that person gets you know, a, a big part of why they get that role. So there's so many things that are out of your control. So you just work to be the best of what you can be and then you get what you get. And a lot of it also is just random lightning striking and whatnot, so. Yeah, it, yeah and you just, that just reminded me of something. There's, there's a choice point in all of this. In order to have longevity as a performer, or I think as a human being, one has to develop control over one's thought processes. You can't control your feelings, but you can learn to have some mastery over your responses. And disappointment is inevitable. Of course I'm disappointed, but what I make that mean is absolutely within my control. And when we all make it mean like, oh, that's not fair, that's not right, you know, what's that world look like? No. When we make it mean, oh, okay, next, you know, just become Dory, you know? Oh, go, 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 go you know, okay, what? What audition? You know, you just go on and choose happy. You know, the other thing that happens when you're casting, because I've worked a, as a director as well, is um, sometimes you don't hire the person who did the best reading. Sometimes you hire somebody else because she's three inches shorter, and that's what you need for opposite the leading man. It can be that arbitrary, as, as they were saying, too. And the other thing I've learned through the years is to just trust what happens. I remember once uh, uh, flying to New York from LA to audition for yet another Broadway show, and I really wanted it, and I, I prepared for it, and I was just, you know, in it. And I didn't get it. And I was devastated. I had already done three Broadway shows, but it didn't matter. I, mean, I wanted to do this one. I went across the street from the Barrymore Theater into a hotel that had a bathroom. I went into the bathroom, tore apart the script, cried in the stall. I mean, I was a total drama queen about it. And, um, you know, I didn't get it. I gave a good audition. I didn't get it. Somebody shorter got it. But she may have been better, too. I don't know. But Three weeks later, I was cast in a major motion picture opposite Jack Nicholson as his wife. <laughs> now, if I had gotten that Broadway show, as much as I thought that was the right part for me, the universe had another idea that yeah. was much more forward-moving for my career, you know, in terms of what, how it moved me forward. So that's something I refer to, and there were other other examples of that that I refer to when I don't get something and I think it was just right for me. I think, well, you know what? I'm just going to trust this to the universe, to God. Put it in his hands, her hands, and trust that the right thing will come. And, and uh, it always does. Sometimes it's not that even losing my theater company when I couldn't pay four times the rent. I thought, this really stinks. You know, I've had it for 50 years. I, I, you know, I want it and blah. Yeah, well, I would never have written my novel if I had still been running that theater company. So there's, and now I'm on novel number two. So I, I trust the movement 
of the universe, and that's really helped a lot in a, in a, in a, in a career in the arts that is so can be so uncertain, you know. So anyway, that's my two cents. Thanks.